Good morning, church. The scripture this morning is taken from Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 to 21. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? We ourselves are Jews by birth, and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuke what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not now defy the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. This is the word of God. Thank you, Waiwa. Good morning. The Lord bless you, church. Praise the Lord. So glad to see all of you this morning. Now, early in the year, Pastor Tation did a three-part sermon series on Galatians. This letter written by Apostle Paul emphasizing the importance of gospel freedom. Over these next three Sundays, I'll be looking at Galatians 2 and 3 as a continuation of the earlier sermon series, what it means to walk in gospel freedom. But before I go into the sermon proper, on behalf of Pastor Nan and the staff team, I want to especially thank someone today and pray for this person. This person is none other than Jermaine. <laughs> who has been a great help. Uh, she joined the admin team some time ago to stand in for Crystal during her maternity leave. Now, sadly for us in the staff team, Jermaine's semester break is over and she's going back to her tertiary studies, which starts tomorrow. So we want to pray especially for her today. Can I invite Jermaine to stand to her feet right now? That's her over there. And uh, let's bow our heads in prayer for her. Feel free to stretch out your hands as we pray, as I pray. Oh Lord, we give thanks to you for Jermaine's contributions to the staff team over the past month since May. She's been a joy to work with and she's been a huge blessing for many of us. We celebrate also her evident growth in the gospel during her time in the staff team. And this morning, we as a church ask that you continue to shape her heart to find fulfillment and contentment in you above all else. May she shine as a beautiful testimony for you among her friends and loved ones. Guide her in the studies and enable her to live a life as an expression of heartfelt worship unto you. In the great name of Jesus, we pray. And all of God's people say, Amen, Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Please be seated. <laughs> Thank you so much. Now, today's chosen passage in the book of Galatians, it's a very provocative text. I'm not sure if you realize that upon why I was reading. John Stott says in his commentary, this is without doubt one of the most tense and dramatic episodes in the New Testament. Here are two leading apostles of Jesus Christ face to face in complete and open conflict. When, Peter, when Paul visited Jerusalem, Peter, together with James and John, gave him the right hand of fellowship. When Peter visited Antioch, Paul opposed him to the face, end quote. Now what's going on here? 
why would Paul share this particular episode? Now, if you have a Bible with you, you can turn with me to Galatians 2, 11 to 21. That will help you as you follow the sermon. Galatians 2, 11 to 21. Now, I believe Paul's sharing of this episode helps us to understand the reality of living out the gospel. Have you ever wondered how to bridge the gap between believing the gospel and living out the gospel? The gospel promises freedom for the believer. You know, I have discovered it. A sinner saved by grace is like a jam. But how do I walk in this precious freedom? Today's text is absolutely helpful to guide us, give us insight into living out the gospel. Now, in the earlier chapters, Paul has been warning the Galatians, the false teachers are wrong. They are leading you to a different gospel. It is a false gospel of works righteousness. Paul says, don't listen to them. Listen to me. I am a true apostle. Revelation from God directly. The gospel I receive is a gospel of grace. That's what Paul is saying. And now to help his readers further understand how dangerous this false gospel is, Paul depicts Peter's negative example. Peter, someone who knows the gospel, believes the gospel. How even Peter, an apostle who learned directly from the Lord Jesus Christ, think about that, learning directly from the Lord Jesus Christ when he was on earth, and he can fail to live out the gospel. It's a cautionary story. Paul ultimately wants his readers to know this. Since we have received the gospel by grace, we must live out this gospel by faith. Now, how do we do that? To this passage, let me draw out four lessons on living out the gospel. Four lessons on living out the gospel. Number one, watch out for the fear of man in your heart. Watch out for the fear of man in your heart. Now, by that, I mean fear of people generically. Watch out for the fear of man. The fear of man is not always the problem if you don't live out the gospel, but it is a very big problem. Potentially more of a problem than you even think. Now, why must you watch out for the fear of man? Because the fear of man leads you down the path of error. Earlier in the letter, Paul said in Galatians 1 that he's not trying to please man as a servant of Christ. This means that he does not fear man. He's, seeking, he's not seeking man's approval. That's why he dares to challenge the false teachers. And here in this passage, he obviously is mentioning Peter's case as a contrast. When you have the fear of man in your heart, you will struggle to live out the gospel, even depart from the gospel altogether. The fear of man will lead you down the path of error. So Paul tells us in verses 11 and 12, that when Paul or Cephas, that is his Aramaic name, they're interchangeable, it means rock. When Peter came to Antioch where he was, Paul opposed him. Because previously, Paul was eating, or Peter was eating with the Gentiles, the non-Jews, and accepting them in fellowship. But when this circumcision party came, those Jewish guys that insisted on the necessity of circumcision for all Christians, including Gentiles, Peter drew back and separated himself. Now, why did Peter do that? Paul gives us the explicit reason in today's text. Peter feared the circumcision party. You see that in verse 12, fearing the circumcision party. This man from the circumcision party looked like really important people. Paul calls them certain men from James. Now, this James is the leader of the Jerusalem church. This is not James, the son of Zebedee, the apostle. This is James, the brother of Jesus. So this man came from James, Jesus' brother. They must be influential. Now, it doesn't mean James thinks exactly the same way as them, but clearly this man are associated with James. And Peter cares too much about what this important man think. He wants their approval. He fears their disapproval. 
so much so that he pulled back from doing what was right. The gospel emphasizes unity between Jews and Gentiles. But here, by choosing separation, Peter has fallen into error. Why? Because of his fear of man. You cannot live out the gospel if you have the fear of man. Now, I tell you the fear of man is a far bigger problem than we commonly think. I believe it is no coincidence that it is in this episode, this episode that emphasizes the departure from the gospel, the fear of man is stressed in this particular way. Because if you fear man, you cannot live out the gospel. Remember what Pastor Nan taught us earlier in the year about courage at the start of the year? We absolutely need courage to live out the gospel, to take risks for God. It is not uncommon to be like Peter. It may be easy to talk about God, for example, in a church setting, like here, where readily people readily agree with you. But maybe when you're in a different setting over the course of the week, your school, your workplace, and when the people around you don't agree, you may actually find yourself hiding your beliefs, hiding your convictions. Or maybe people propose something, actually, you would say dishonest at work, and you're thinking about it, you're hearing it, but you just decide to go along with it. Or maybe there's an opportunity to tell others about the gospel, or tell others about what drives you, what motivates you, or reasons for your success but you fearfully choose to omit God and His grace out of the sharing of your story. Fear of man, the exact same thing. That's what's happening in our hearts. You know, years ago before this episode, Peter denied Christ verbally out of fear. He said, I don't know this man, I don't know this man, I don't know this man. Once again, Peter effectively denies Christ through his actions out of fear. The fear of man is a pervasive problem for many hearts. It enslaves you. It stops you from living out the gospel. It leads you down the path of error. Watch out for it. And you should watch out for the fear of man, not just because it leads you down the path of error, but because it affects others around you as well. Paul says that in verse 13, the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically. Even Barnabas, the son of encouragement, that's what his name means, Barnabas, son of encouragement. He was led astray by the hypocrisy. He honestly should have been far less encouraging here. Maybe he was too eager to affirm Peter. The encouraging types tend to do that want to affirm, want to encourage in everything that you do. Whatever the reason, no one challenges Peter, except Paul. Paul speaks into the situation, and this gives us our second lesson on living out the gospel. Number two, welcome godly correction from those who love you. Welcome godly correction from those who love you. You know, here's one error that many of us make when we think about living out the gospel. We think too highly of ourselves. We actually think, many of us think, we can live out the gospel on our own. The truth is that we cannot. We actually need community. All of us. That's why in the recent sermon series on marriage and unmarriage, you heard that it's good to be equally yoked to be in Christian families where Christian values are treasured and emphasized. That's also why we need to be in a church community. That's why in Agape, we encourage everyone to be in a cell group community. Now, on that note, if any one of you here considers Agape, maybe you're new here, but you consider Agape your spiritual home and still not yet in the cell group, we welcome you to reach out to us. Sokwe, myself, Pastor Tation, and William, we're the four cell overseers, and we will be most happy to find a cell group for you. A spiritual community of brothers and sisters where you can best live out the gospel. The truth is that we all have blind spots like Peter. 
people can see your blind spots in a way that you cannot. You know, while having a meal, you might have had this experience. Maybe you have rise on your nose or rise on your face. You can't quite see it, of course. You need someone who loves you enough to tell you there's something there. The truth is that if the person is a stranger to you, he or she might be too embarrassed to say anything for, to you. Just look at it and just like thinking, uh, never mind, just, just give it a miss. But if the person loves you, he or she is close to you, the person will be very willing to point out to you the truth quite quickly, just like Paul did for Peter. Oftentimes, God sends people to help us to correct our walk with him. Listen to how Paul describes what he saw. He says in verse 14 that he saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel. The Greek phrase here for not in step literally means they are not walking straight, not upright. The front part of the Greek word is ortho, from which we get the word orthopedic which deals with the correction and treatment of patients with skeletal deformities, helping the patients walk straight. And that's what Paul is doing. He sees crookedness and he's doing a loving correction, correcting your walk. The treatment can be painful, but it's going to be helpful. As we see in Peter's letters, written after this letter to the Galatians, Peter evidently has a good relationship with Paul. So we know that Peter accepts this, clearly accepts this correction from Paul. And this is the correction that Paul offers Peter. He asked him this question in verse 14. He says, if you were a Jew, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? He's effectively saying, Peter, as a Jew, you have not been observing the Jewish foot laws. And now suddenly, you are wanting the Gentiles to follow these foot laws. That's hypocritical. If you do that, you are undermining the gospel. Because the gospel declares that people are justified, made clean by faith in Jesus Christ. Not by works of the law. Not by observing these Jewish table regulations. This is a very serious gospel issue. In the larger scheme of things, I believe God in his providence must have planned for Paul to correct Peter on this important issue. Question worth asking all of us this morning, dear people. Who in your life do you sense is God's loving providence to you to help you in your walk with God? And to this day, I'm thankful that through my toughest times, my wife was there to help me to see that my worth is not derived from my ministry, not from my performance, what I can do for God. We need to welcome godly correction from those who love us. Now, as I say this, I also want to emphasize that this does not mean that we simply go around and just tell everybody what we think they're doing wrong. Don't do that. In their walk with God. Like, you're wrong here, you're wrong there. Every one of you is wrong. That will be very unkind and presumptuous. We must remember that in this passage, firstly, Paul is an apostle of Jesus Christ. He's speaking with God's authority into the situation. So the forcefulness of what he's saying is tied to his God-given authority. Secondly, I honestly believe that Peter must have either given permission for Paul to share the story or that Peter himself clearly recognized the value of having this story shared this way. Paul is not gossiping about Peter with any malicious intent to put him down. No. Paul is taking the opportunity to address publicly what was a public matter in the early church. It's worth noting that culturally, such sharing is also acceptable as well during that time. It was actually not uncommon for disputes and, res and resolutions then to be discussed openly for the benefit of the larger community. Now for us today, 
We want to speak truth into people's lives, but we want to do so graciously. Similarly, we want to have humble hearts that allow people to speak into our lives. But you don't have to simply listen to everyone. Listen to those whom you know love you. And specifically, listen to them, not for just every topic under the sky, but when they are exhorting you to walk in truth, with, in step with the gospel, in step with the truth of the gospel. Welcome such people in your life and be the kind of person that others welcome into their lives. So people, community matters. Community matters in living out the gospel. But what goes on in our hearts matters as well. And this is the third lesson. Renounce old patterns of thinking and feeling. Renounce old patterns of thinking and feeling. Now, it's very likely that Peter has reverted to old patterns of thinking and feeling in the way he's engaging with the Gentiles. Deep down, it's not just a doctrinal issue of justification by faith in Christ. There likely is also the familiar feeling of ethnic superiority. As a Jewish man feeling superior to unclean Gentiles all his life, he must have taken pride in his Jewish identity growing up. Do you still remember what God did to change his mindset? God revealed to him once through a vision, Acts chapter 10, whole blanket of animals, clean and unclean, and God said, kill and eat. That means the previously unclean animals are clean. You can eat them. That's what God is saying. And through that vision, God was teaching Peter. The barrier between Jews and Gentiles have been removed through Christ. All are justified to Jesus Christ, not by works of the law. You don't have to observe those ceremonial laws anymore. Yet we see here Paul, Peter going back to the same old patterns he was familiar with. It's sobering to see how you can have the right doctrine, right theology, and yet your life is still marked by legalism. This is a very sobering warning to every one of us here. You can have the right theology, say all the right things, think all the right things, and yet somehow still be functionally legalistic. If Peter, with all his right doctrinal confessions, professions of faith, can still struggle practically with legalism, which means looking to something else beside Jesus Christ in order to be clean and acceptable before God, then we must be super careful that this might happen to us too. We need to renounce those old patterns of thinking and feeling, no matter how much comfort it has even provided us previously. I remember some time ago, I attended a wake and I was talking to a stranger who happened to be sitting at the same table, this lady, and I introduced myself and we started talking about religion. So I asked her questions about her religion and she shared with me what she liked about her religion. I listened respectfully. Then thereafter, I explained to her Christianity, what we believe about the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ and our need as sinners for a savior, and I'll need to depend on him, to trust in him. So I asked her frankly what she thought about that. Apparently she had heard about it before. And she was very honest with me actually. She said that she doesn't find such thinking helpful for her life. She by far prefers the mindset that you cannot depend on anyone else, including God, you cannot depend on anyone else in your life. The only person you can depend on is yourself. That's how she likes to think. Like you can make a way. If you work hard, you will succeed. It's all up to you. She finds this worldview so much more helpful for her, she said. So she struggles to think that she needs to depend on God, like depend on God for exams, depend on God for work, depend on God for life, whatever. And as I heard her, I told her that, yeah, I mean, Christians ultimately depend on God, yes. But it doesn't mean that we don't put in effort. We recognize, however, that our efforts do not determine the final outcomes. 
Neither do we look to our own performances for our worth. Our worth comes from who we are in Christ. So the conversation ended amicably, but one big takeaway I got from the conversation as I reflected on it was that for her, the best way to live is to depend on herself was so ingrained within her. She had been thinking like that all her life. It's probably even emotional for her. In her opinion, all her life, her successes have come because she has thought in this particular way. Very hard for her to abandon all that for God, even as she hears me. She needs to see and taste that the gospel is indeed greater than whatever she's holding on to. You know, when you see little toddlers, oftentimes you see them bring their favorite soft toy or pillow they carry around with them everywhere. In Mandarin, you call it chou chou, smelly. It can be unhygienic if it's not washed. I had one when I was young. <laughs> no more already. I don't know where it went. <laughs> it's a security blanket, a source of comfort and security. It can be quite scary to let go, actually. You might have had it yourself when you were young. And it's a struggle to let go because of what it represents to you. Comfort and security. For Peter, following the works of the law for some form of acceptance before God has always been his security blanket, his emotional cho-cho. I imagine since he was a little boy. And Paul is reminding him now you got to let it go. Renounce this old patterns of thinking and feeling and put your trust in God, in Christ, absolutely. What's your emotional total? What is that? How you think about life, your career, your wealth, romance, your ideal family, maybe your idea of keeping a distance from people to protect your heart, even people in church, your retirement plans, whatever. Maybe you got it from your parents growing up, from life experiences, from your culture, and your spirit is still holding on to it. Everyone who comes near you can actually smell what's wrong. But it still smells good to you. I know it brings you comfort and security. But there is something better. The gospel of Jesus Christ. Your true source of comfort and security. It's time Drop it. Let it go so that you can walk in true gospel freedom. You know, many scholars would say, verse 15 is likely to be a continuation of what Paul is saying directly to Peter, even though in the English version, it doesn't have the open and close inverted commas. Using in that exact conversation, because in verse 15, he starts off by saying, we ourselves are Jews. So he was talking to, to Peter, more likely than not. Now see how Paul tries to exhort Peter to renounce those old patterns, to depart from the works of the law by stressing how problematic Peter's approach is. And he did it in a very interesting way. Let me read this for you. Let me flash it out. Let me read this for you. He says, he put it this way. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Now I've read this verses so many times in my life, but this week was the first time in my life I caught Paul's exasperation in his tone. 
Because if you look hard at it, there's not much of an argument here. Just sheer declaration and repetition of the truth. Essentially, he's saying something like this. We are Jews and yet we know this. A person is not justified by works of the law. We are not justified by works of the law because by works of the law, no one will be justified. We are justified in Jesus Christ. We are believed in Christ to be justified by faith in Jesus Christ. Look at the amount of repetition he has. Now, you see, when do you ever repeat yourself like that to someone? I tell you when. You might have done that before in your life. When the matter is super serious, when you're emotionally intense about it. Try a mother of a young boy after he dashes across the road amidst heavy traffic. I told you not to run across the road like this. So many cars, you run across the road like this, you'll get knocked down by and die. I don't want to see you run across the road like this ever again. I don't want to get knocked down and die. <laughs> not much of an argument. Just keep repeating. Because I don't want to see you get knocked down and die. Super important. <laughs> you see, when you read the Bible, you don't want just to catch the words. You want to catch the tone. Because the tone can impress upon you how serious this matter is. It is not negotiable. Paul is saying this gospel issue is super, super serious. Don't revert to your own old patterns of thinking and feeling. These old patterns are not true. They need to be replaced, rejected. By works of the law, no one will be justified. You will not be righteous before God by works of the law. The only way God justifies the ungodly, Romans 4, 5 language, is through faith in Jesus Christ. You need to embrace this truth for your salvation. You need to embrace this truth for the flourishing of your life. In verses 17 and 18, Paul further provides theological clarity on why the old patterns need to be renounced. And it's a brilliant argument. He says this, and I read this to you. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuke what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. Now here, Paul poses a rhetorical question, a potential objection. If we seek to be justified in Christ, we don't adhere to the law as we used to, that will make us sinners. And wouldn't Christ then be guilty of promoting sin in our lives? Now Paul rejects that idea altogether. He says, certainly not. Paul says, no. What is worse, if we return back, if he returns back to obeying the law in order to be justified, because that goes against the truth he has preached, rebuilding what he has torn down. And if that's the case, that'll be worse. That's a transgression, active rebellion, not just missing the mark sin. It's a serious violation against the gospel. It's even more serious than the many sins we may commit. You see, the sinner can always run back to Christ. Do you know that? It is true that no matter what you have done this week, there's still plenty of grace for you. If you, the sinner, runs to Jesus Christ to seek his forgiveness, but if you negate the gospel, you reject the gospel through your legalism, you declare your dependence on the law to make you acceptable before God, then there's no grace for you. Verse 21, Paul completes his train of thought. He teaches us that if you are a legalist, you are nullifying the grace of God. You are trying to gain righteousness, a right standing before God through observing the law. It's like Christ died for no purpose. And that's the ultimate insult. Telling Jesus Christ that you don't need his sacrifice. You can do life on your own, just fine. Yes, Jesus died on the cross, but there's no spiritual purpose behind it. That would be wrong. Jesus says, the work is finished. It's like a perfect document. Completed. Saved 
in PDF form is given to you and then you end up turning it back into a Word document and you're still editing and saving it. You are behaving as though it's not done. PDF, not Word document. Completed, finished. You want to add something else on top of what Jesus did to be acceptable before God. Don't ever do that. Don't ever do that. That's a mistake. On that day, Peter made this mistake. The Galatians made this mistake. That's why Paul is writing to them this way. And God says to us today as a church, don't make the same mistake again. Don't. Renounce the old patterns of thinking and feeling. Do not nullify the grace of God. God's grace is so important in living out the gospel. But we so need to connect the receiving of the gospel by grace to living out the gospel by faith. To connect the dots between grace and faith. We need to emphasize our union with Christ. And that's lesson four on living out the gospel. Emphasize your union with Christ. <clears throat> Look at Paul's emphasis on how we need to live out the gospel. He didn't say that we need to figure out how to observe the law better. It's not like the gospel gives us salvation, then we need to obey the Jewish civil law, ceremonial law, or even the moral law to maintain our status before God. He didn't say that. Towards the end of this particular passage, he stressed the life of the Christian in relation to dying with the crucified Christ and living with the resurrected Christ. He says in verse 19 to 20, for through the law, I died to the law, so that I may live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, the Christian life is not an immoral life. It is not a lawless life, but it's not about trying to gain favor with God through our works of the law. Never. The Christian life is fueled by greater power. It's far more transformative because it involves the old self dying and the new creation living. Dying to the law, crucified with Christ, and Christ living in me. The spirit in me. This is union with Christ. I love this last line. Living by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, in one line, you see living out the gospel that comes from faith. By faith. Yet you see the motivation behind it. The grace from the gospel. Christ, the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Many years ago, I once saw on video two mega church preachers on a stage in a church. One was declaring very emphatically, he said, I am a grace preacher, grace preacher. He teaches people to just rest in the finished work of Christ, doesn't tell people to live out their faith, doesn't tell people to live actively, righteously for God. He thinks that's not his focus, just stress and emphasize grace. And then the other one will say, oh, that's very good. Uh, God has told me to preach faith. That the people of God need to have faith to believe in what God is doing. Be positive to develop a posture of faith. Now I want to say here, I think they are making a mistake. Grace and faith are not meant to be separated this way, as though you can only preach one and not the other. If one can be preached to the exclusion of the other, then it's probably false grace and false faith. Paul the Apostle preached both the importance of God's grace and human faith in response. If you say you receive God's grace, but don't live it out by faith, you misrepresent the gospel. If you appreciate the grace, yet not actively live by faith in Him, it's a mistake. Because God's grace is meant to fuel your faith. 
The gospel tells you that you can be courageous for God because the gospel assures us God's grace is always enough for you. Whether you succeed or whether you fail, God's grace is always there. Step up in faith. You don't have to shrink back in fear, no matter the opposition. If you say you have faith, but you neglect God's grace, you misrepresent the gospel. If you believe that greater things have yet to come, yet your faith is in a good, prosperous outcomes in life, it's a mistake. Because your faith fundamentally is meant to be in Jesus Christ. The reason you can be bold in prayer for God's glory, hopeful in all circumstances, is because of Christ who has promised good to you, to all who believe in him. So what does the gospel teach us? Both grace and faith. And our union is with Christ is where grace and faith meet beautifully. Grace because the gospel is all about God's grace, not by human effort or merit, but faith because I must lift out this gospel by faith. If you forget your union with Christ, you won't live out the gospel. You would either have a lot of so-called grace without faith or a lot of so-called faith without grace. But when you emphasize your union with Christ, much like Paul did, you who receive the gospel by grace will live out this gospel by faith. You know, I cannot preach on Galatians 2.20 in our church and not mention Ms. Lily O. Rogers, our church founder. For the church pioneers who are mentored by her, they would have heard her emphasize this death life principle in Galatians, which is so foundational for our own walk with God. Many of you have already heard me share this account over the pulpit, but there are a number of you who are newer to our church and it's worth sharing again. 1972, on the night of November 24th, 11 p.m., until 25th November, 5 a.m., Miss Rogers was wrestling with the Lord. In a book, Pray Reading the Bible, she said the Holy Spirit convicted her of a sinful self-life. And ever since then, she said, Galatians 2.20 will be the first thought and prayer for her every single morning. How do you not forget your union with Christ? How do you consciously live out the gospel? Try remembering reciting Galatians 2.20 every morning when, when you're awake. First thought, every single day. Not your phone, not your WhatsApp, not social media. Galatians 2.20. In honor of Ms. Rogers, let me quote Galatians 2.20 in the wording she had written in her book. She quotes it as, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. She said that from that time on, her prayer life changed. She said that she didn't pray, help me do it anymore. Not that it's wrong, but she just didn't want to pray that anymore. She would pray instead, Lord, you do it. It's your work. You do it through me. Live your very life through me. She had a deep appreciation of her union with Christ. You know, I hear that explanation in the book, and I look at the translation that she used. It's closer to a KJV rendering, and I underline it for you. Live by the faith of the Son of God. Now, the version Miss Rogers remembered, if you think about it, didn't stress human faith, but rather the faithfulness of the Son of God. Now, this is debatable which one Paul was emphasizing here. 
And obviously, ESV and many other modern translations went with, I live by faith in the Son of God, stressing human faith, our faith. Yet, as I was reflecting about it this week, I think there's something beautiful even in how Ms. Rogers had sought to remember Galatians 2.20, which mirrors Agape's emphasis, gospel emphasis many years later. I live by the faith of the Son of God. This Son of God who became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God, who took on our defilement so that we might be made clean, who was rejected so that we might be embraced forever. That's the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. That's what encouraged Miss Rogers every single day. It's because Jesus is faithful to us, that's how we can even be faithful to God. Even when we are faithless, even when we feel like we cannot do it anymore, God remains faithful. And Ms. Rogers, through her legacy, taught us to remember that God is faithful to do what he has promised. Jesus is faithful to complete the good work in you. Because our gracious Lord is faithful, we can invite him to do his work in and through us. And by so doing, may we be found faithful in living out the gospel. I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I. Christ lives in me. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Oh Lord, we are grateful for how you have reminded us this morning that this beautiful gospel that we have received by grace is meant to be a gospel that transforms us, that leads us to live, live out the gospel by faith. We cannot do that by our own strength. We need you. We, today, we let go of our works righteousness and cling once again to the old rugged cross. This is the justification we need. We stand before you worthy because of our crucified Savior, because of our resurrected King. Lord, let us not forget our precious union with you. The Spirit of the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Good Shepherd, the Prince of Peace, Emmanuel, the son of David, the son of God who lives in us. Be glorified, O God, in our living for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>